اور دین و سنیت کو ثابت بھی کیا تو لہٰذا وہ ان قریب تشریف لائیں گے اور ان کا خطاب نایاب سماعت فرمائیں گے اور آپ کے ذہنوں میں رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم خاتم النبیین ہیں اس کے تعلق سے جو بھی اگر سوال ہو تو آپ سوال بھی کریں گے انشاءاللہ تبارک و تعالی اس کا تشفی بخش آپ کو جواب بھی انعیت کیا جائے گا تو حضرات محترم آئیے ہم اپنی اس بزم کا آگاز شروعات اللہ کی کتاب قرآن پاک سے کرتے ہیں تو اللہ فرماتا ہے وَإِذَا قُرِيَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَانْسِتُوا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ اور جب قرآن پاک کی تلاوت کی جائے تو خاموشی کے ساتھ غور و فکر کے ساتھ اسے سنو تاکہ تم پر رحم کیا جائے تو اس سے ایک بات یہ بھی ثابت ہوتی ہے کہ جہاں قرآن پاک کی تلاوت ہوتی ہے وہاں اللہ پاک کی رحمت نازل ہوتی ہے اللہ پاک کی رحمت نازل ہوتی ہے حضرات محترم ایک گاڑی ہے بی ایم ڈبلیو بلو کلر کی اگر اس نے راستہ بلوک کیا ہے پلیز آپ اسے مو کریں ہٹا لے تو مہربانی ہوگی تو حضرات محترم تو میں اب تلاوت قرآن پاک کے لیے ہماری جماعت کے ممتاز قاری قاری خوش الحان حضرت حافظ و قاری توفیر صاحب گورجی سے گزارش کروں گا کہ وہ تشریف لائیں اور قرآن پاک کی تلاوت میں شرمائیں وَإِذَا الْجِحَادُ فُجِّرَتْ وَإِذَا الْقُبُورُ بُعْثِرَتْ عَلِمَتْ نَفْسٌ قَدَّمَتْ وَأَخْخَرَتْ يا أيها الإنسان ما غرك بربك الكريم الذي خلقك فسواك فعدلك
Oh. 
گناہ پر ہے زگاری واہ واہ اس طرف روزے کا نور اس سمت میں بر کی بہار اس طرف روزے کا نور اس سمت میں بر کی بہار بیچ میں جنت کی پیاری پیاری کیا ریواہ واہ بیچ میں جنت کی پیاری پیاری کیا ریواہ واہ انگلیاں ہیں فیض پر ٹوٹے ہیں پیاسے جوم کر انگلیاں ہیں فیض پر ٹوٹے ہیں پیاسے جوم کر ندیاں پر آ بے رحمت کی ہے جاری واہ واہ ندیاں پنج آ بے رحمت کی ہے جاری واہ واہ صلی اللہ علیہ محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم صلی اللہ علیہ محمد محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم پیش حق مجدہ شفاعت کا سناتے جائیں گے پیش حق مجدہ شفاعت کا سناتے جائیں گے آپ روتے جائیں گے ہم کو ہساتے جائیں گے آپ روتے جائیں گے ہم کو ہساتے جائیں گے اس عطے دی ہے خدا نے دا من محبوب کو اس عطے دی ہے خدا نے دا من محبوب کو جرم کھلتے جائیں اور وہ چھپاتے جائیں گے جرم کھلتے جائیں گے اور وہ چھپاتے جائیں گے صلی اللہ علیہ محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم صلی اللہ علیہ محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم صبح تہبہ میں ہوئی بتتا ہے بارہ نور کا صبح تہبہ میں ہوئی بتتا ہے بارہ نور کا صدقہ لینے نور کا آیا ہے تارہ نور کا باروی کے چاند کا مجرا ہے سجدہ نور کا بارہ برجوں سے جھکا ایک ایک ستارہ نور کا میں گدا تو بادشاہ بردے 
प्याला नूर का मैं गदा तू बादशाह मैं गदा तू बादशाह भर दे प्याला नूर का नूर दिन दूना तेरा दे डाल सदका नूर का तेरी नस्ल पाक में है बचा बचा नूर का तेरी नस्ल पाक में है बचा बचा नूर का तू है ऐने नूर तेरा सब घराना नूर का शम मदिल मिशिका तन सीना जो जा जा नूर का शम दिल मिशिका तन सीना जो जा जा नूर का तेरे सूरत के लिए आया है सूरा नूर का सल्लाह अला मोहम्मद सल्लाह अलह वसलम हशेर तक डाले के हम पैदा इशे मौला की धूम हशेर तक डाले के हम पैदा इशे मौला की धूम मिसले फारस नजद के किल ए गिरा ते जाएंगे और खा के हो जाए अदू जल कर मगर हम तो रजा हो जाए अदू जल कर मगर हम तो रजा दम में जब तक दम है जिक्र उनका सुनाते जाएंगे दम में जब तक दम है जिक्र उनका सुनाते जाएंगे और ये रजाए अहमद नूरी का फैज नूर है रजाए अहमद नूरी का फैज नूर है हो गई मेरी गजल बर कर कसीदा नूर का हो गई मेरी गजल बर कर कसीदा नूर का सल्ला मोहम्मद सल्लाह वसलम सल्ला मोहम्मद सल्लाह वसलम हजरात मोहतरम ये थे अली जनाब मोना सुफियान सलम जो आला हजरत फाजिल बरेलवी रदी अल्लाह तलाम पे शर्मा रहे थे और हजरात मोहतरम आला हजरत के अशार की तशरी तो करें तो ये बहुत वक्त होता है बस एक अशार पढ़ देता हूँ कि फतह बाब नबूत पे बेहद दुरूद इमाम महमद रजा ने सिर्फ नातिया कलाम लिखा है लेकिन नात नहीं लिखी हदीसों को बयान किया तफसीर बयान की तफसीर बयान की है देखो यहाँ फरमा फतह बाब नबूत पर बेहद दुरूद दौर खत्म रसालत पे लाखों सलाम दौर खत्म खत्म नबूत अकीदा बयान फरमा दिया जिसके लिए हम यहाँ पर हाजिर आए हैं अबिला तखिर में हजरत मौलाना डॉक्टर मोहम्मद असरार किबला साहब की, की बारगाह में गुजारिश करूँगा हजरत वाला तशरीफ लाएँ और अपने नूरानी इरफानी हक्कानी बयान से सामीन के कलूबों को मुनवर मुजला फरमाएँ नारे तकबीर नारे रसालत नारे रसालत अहल सुन्नत अहल सुन्नत ताजदार ख़त्म नबूत
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله حمد الشاكرين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه يجمعين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها والنور الأبصار وضيائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد كلما ذكرك الذاكرون وغفل عن ذكرك الغافلون Today's subject is the subject of false prophets because of the importance of ختم النبوة finality of prophethood that prophethood finished with سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم and recently, the month of Rajab passed us by. The month of Rajab, according to some of the muhaddithin, is the month in which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam undertook the night journey, Laylatul Isra wal Mi'raj and the ascension. And the Salah, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led the, the Anbiya alayhi salatu wa salam in prayer in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Sharif denoting finality of prophethood and finality of prophethood is intrinsically linked with al-masjid al-aqsa al-sharif so it is not without surprise that when al-masjid al-aqsa al-sharif is under occupation we have people attempting to violate the tenet of faith which is finality of prophethood also completing thereby that the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam informed us that after his time, more than 27 liars shall come, each one claiming to be a Nabi. And in another hadith, 30 of these individuals shall appear, each one claiming to be a Nabi, meaning Dajjajila, meaning Dajjals prior to the main Dajjal. And all 30 have in actual fact appeared from the time of Musaylama al kadhab who was from Banu Hanifa, which is in Eastern Arabian Peninsula. And when he was killed from that time, meaning in the time of Sayyiduna, when Sayyiduna Khalid bin Al-Walid radiallahu anhu and his armies were dispatched by Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu and the armies of the companions alayhim ridwan, they would shout the slogan, La Ya Muhammadah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam as mentioned by Abu Fida Ismail bin Kathir in his book Al Bidai wa Nihaya, this occurred in the area known as Al Yamama when Sayyiduna Wahshi radiallahu ta'ala anhu threw a javelin that killed Musaylam al Kadhab and he said, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this makes up for having martyred Sayyiduna Hamza radiallahu anhu in his days of Jahiliyyah. So this occurred in Al Yamama, and this was Musaylam Al Kadhab was one of the first false prophets. But within that period of time, you had other false prophets, which I have detailed in my new book, Navigating the End of Times. There is a detail on Khatmun Nabuwa and a list of all the false prophets from that period of time. There is also detail with regard to Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani. This man appeared, what we would say, Kazabu Punjab. He was the liar of Punjab from India in that time before partition. Punjab was one state. And within Punjab, currently in the Indian part of Punjab, there is an area known as Qadiyan. And he is well known. His fitna, his tribulation is well known for us because we all are from the the Indian subcontinent from Hind, the correct word is Hind, 
We are from Biladul Hind. And Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadian, his movement is still a fitna, a tribulation, because they enter into areas in Africa where there is poverty. They build buildings which they refer to as masajid and invite people, African people, into those masajid, giving them the false teachings of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani. Similarly, in America, in the United States of America, at the turn of the 1900s, you had, and this aspect I didn't cover in the book, what I will discuss today I didn't cover in the book. You had the influence of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani not only remaining in the confines of the Indian subcontinent, it spread within his lifetime across into America. How some of those who adopted the faith of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani, this should not surprise us. In the Indian subcontinent, even in Pakistan today, there are many false people who give false teachings and the people adopt their teachings. Like in Pakistan today, there is a man who refers to himself as La, La Thani Sarkar. Yes, he has hundreds and thousands of followers. And the ulama in those regions sometimes are unable to speak against them because they fear against, uh, for their lives. So these type of people, they always have numerous people following them. So what Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani, some back, background detail for you regarding him. Initially he was, in his early days in his village, he studied some basic Farsi, some basic uh, Arabic. And his Arabic is not too fantastic. Recently in a discussion with one of the Qadiani preachers, he said to me that Mirza Ghulam had written a tafsir of the Qur'an and Surah Al-Fatiha. If you are able to write a better tafsir, then you have defeated him. But I said to him, having read Mirza Qadiani's prose, I was not too impressed with his Arabic. But Mirza Ghulam, he had studied some of this Arabic prose in his early days, and then he went to Sialkot. So he's born in the 1830s, in the 1850s and 60s, he worked in Sialkot as a, as a clerk in a shop. And in that time, he interacted with Christian missionaries. So when he interacted with Christian missionaries, he debated Christian missionaries. And I mentioned in one place in Victoria Park Masjid that he was hailed as a hero by the Wahhabis. He was hailed as a hero by the Wahhabis. The Qadianis misused this clip to say that I am saying that he was a hero for Islam. But I said he was hailed as a hero for Islam in the context that he was, if you look historically, no Sunni ulama ever praised him for his work. So in that time, you had the likes, the tabaqa of Fadlul Haq Khair Abadi Rahimullah, that tabaqa of ulama, that tabaqa meaning synchronic layer of ulama, and you had the likes of Ghulam Dastagir. Qusuri rahimallahu ta'ala, who was the first one to refute Mirza Ghulam Ahmad in the Arabic language. When they refuted him, he was not hailed as a, as a hero of Islam by the Sunni ulama. The Wahhabi ulama, like Siddiq Hassan Khan, he married the princess of Bhopal at the time. And what happened? She funded some of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad's initial works when he was still ostensibly a Muslim, before he became a murtad, someone who renegades from the religion. And then in the 1860s, when he did this, they say that they venerated him to such an extent that people would not permit the water of the wudu to fall on the ground for Mirza, Mirza Ghulam. So if he performed wudu, they venerated him to such a degree. Now this leads, of course, to problems with the spiritual problems, ailments of the ego. Where a person begins to think that the efforts that they have done are from themselves and not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Mirza Ghulam Ahmad developed 
what today uh, today's psychiatrists would say narcissistic personality disorder and megalomania all these terms that they give but really and truly al imam abu hamid muhammad al ghazali rahimallahu ta'ala who passed away the year 505 hijri the mujaddid in his book ihya ulum al din he already gave the elements of these elements of the heart amrad al qalb when Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani believed in his own greatness later in life, when he became ill, he took to taking medicines which contained opium and other things. If you read the details of this, the Qadiani, he actually contacted me regarding this, saying, you are lying about Mirza Sahib. This is all referenced and sourced. When he took these medis medications, I believe this triggered his hallucinations. So this triggered his hallucinations combined with his megalomania. And I give some detail of this very quickly. In the book, there's detail regarding this in into his claims of uh, initially Mahdi, initially being Mahdi, then claiming that Nabuwa meaning what is the concept of Zilli Nabi? What is the concept of Zilli Nabi? A shadow prophet. Meaning, even the Diobandis, in their commentaries, if you check the book uh, in Al Mantiq of Fadlul Imam Khairabadi Rahmallah Ta'ala, his book Al Mirqat, if you check the common commentary published by the Diobandis, in that commentary, you will find in the introduction that the commentator states, he gives the interpretation of Tahdirun Nas of Qasim Nanotwi regarding Nabuwa that he says the Prophet is like the sun and the other prophets are like the stars that they take prophethood from the sun. This is a, an innovation in deen. Nabuwa is equal to all the prophets. Like we say al-insan, everyone is al-insan. You don't say one insan takes his insaniya from the other ins insan, human being. Nabuwa is equal to all the prophets. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is khatamun nabiyyin, finality of prophets. So then they said, if a prophet comes after, it's not relating to time. It relates to what Aslan Nabuwa, essence of prophethood, is found in the Prophet. But if another Prophet comes afterwards, it does not harm the finality of prophethood. And then, even Qadianis, what they say is they say, You Sunnis are contradicting yourself because you believe Sayyiduna Isa will descend in the end of times. You need to know the response to this. Do not just be sheep like uh, these followers of these peers, jahil peers. They just follow their peers and they don't know how to give a response. You Sunni Muslims, the public should know how to respond to these arguments. Meaning if you ever ask this, you Sunni Muslims believe Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam shall return back to earth, then that means you believe in a new prophet. The response is very simple. That Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam was a Nabi before was before he was taken up to the heavens. He's just returning back. It's what's meant by Khatamun Nabiyyin is that there is no new announcement of a new prophet. It's a simple response. But you will be surprised how many of our people have become sheep in how they even attain knowledge of basics of the religion. So when Mirza Ghulam Ahmad claimed this, he even had a masjid constructed, what they refer to as masjid, a masjid barar of course, harmful masjid. He had a masjid, a so-called masjid constructed in Qadian in the village. And then within that village, he claimed revelations were sent to him. And in that context, he made so many prophets, so-called prophecies. You read my book, you will laugh because there was George Prince, a man called George Prince from the UK at the time who claimed to be Jesus reincarnated. 
And Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, he did Mubahala with this George Prince. And the British newspapers made caricatures of Mirza Ghulam and George Prince. The British newspapers, the tabloids at that time, made caricatures of him. Nevertheless, in that period of time, he constructed a tower and he said this tower, now, when you discuss with the Qadiani, they don't like being referred to as Qadiani. They refer to themselves as Ahmadi. When you discuss with these people, they will always discuss with you firstly the passing away of Isa alayhi salam. They will not move away from that subject. They will say to you, you must believe Isa alayhi salam passed away and he's buried on earth. But in reality, this is what uh, a distraction from the real subject. What is the real subject? They must prove and demonstrate that a man born in Punjab in the early 1800s, meaning the same place as uh, Guru Nanak, there are some of these pseudo Sufi groups, Mutasawwifa. There are uh, Mutasawwifa. In fact, Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan ta'ala, when he lists the sects, he lists one of the sects as a group of these pseudo Sufis. You check this, he, he, he lists it as a sect. And what this sect has done since 1921 and the passing away of Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, they hide themselves behind him. Why? Because he refuted Wahhabis and Diobandis, and Wahhabis and Diobandis refute these pseudo-Sufis, they need to hide behind someone who refuted Wahhabis and Diobandis. But they will never teach their followers that Imam Ahmad Rida Khan ta'ala also refuted them. You check his works. How many times has he refuted pseudo-Sufis, these uh, pseudo-Sufi groups? So, in the early 1900s, what he did, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, he had a tower constructed. This tower, he claimed, was the tower that Isa is mentioned in the Sahih of Imam Muslim and other hadith works. That he shall descend at a white minaret, Sharqay Damishq, at the eastern part of Damascus. Yes. So if you draw a line from Damascus, into the eastern direction, it lands in the direction, according to him, of Qadian. So east of Damascus means in Qadian, according to him. But of course the hadith is referring to Damascus itself, eastern Damascus. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad at that time even dispatched a man to go and look in Damascus for a minaret. And they claim that there was no such minaret. This is false. There are two minarets. One is in the eastern part of Al Jami Al Umuwi. They say Al Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali rahimallahu ta'ala ascended this, uh, this minaret when he wrote parts of his Ihya wa Ulum al Deen. Additionally, there is a, another white minaret in Bab Tuma, the Christian district in Damascus. And Al Imam Abu Al Fida Ismail bin Kathir, Rahimallahu Ta'ala, in his book Al Nihaya, which is on the Akhirul Zaman, he mentions that there was no white minaret in Damascus. There was no white minaret in Damascus until his time. It was constructed after over 700 years after the Prophet foretold this. Meaning, Dalil al Nabuwa, a sign of prophethood. That after 700 years on the eastern side, of Damascus, the white minaret was constructed. That white minaret still exists. In fact, even the cross, the crucifix, which is on top of the minaret, is also white. The entire tower is white. So then Mirza Ghulam, when he constructed this tower, in reality, some people think it was a British conspiracy to have placed Mirza Ghulam at the time. But when you study his biography, I personally think he was just a megalomaniac, a person who claimed prophethood, and because he was in a rural uh, area, rural area of Punjab, 
He was, and the Punjab region is known. In fact, the entire Indian subcontinent is known to have weird cults. I was mentioning about Guru Nanak. Someone uh, was questioning me uh, regarding Guru Nanak, whether he was a real prophet or not. Because some of these uh, false Punjabi peers, what they do is they tell their followers, uh, uh, Guru Nanak was a wali and Guru Nanak was this and Guru Nanak was that. Waliyadu billah. Guru Nanak was a kafir. And like Guru Nanak, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad was a kafir. Because they, in, uh, what you find in some uh, influences within Punjab and the Indian subcontinent, there is a perennialistic way of thinking. It's from the time of Imam Ahmad Sir Hindi rahmallahu ta'ala refuted it, meaning what they refer to as deen e ilai This way of thinking, this poetry when they say, uh, oh, leave the mandir and leave the masjid and you know, these absurd poetries that they come out with, most of it I do not understand, but it, it, what I do understand is that it calls for what? Perennialism. So, similarly, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad was from this type of region. So when he claimed prophethood, he attracted thousands of followers. But in reality, there was no conspiracy. It was a social, uh, social construct and a social change that occurred that, of course, the ulama would have to refute this bid'ah that occurred at that time. And as I mentioned, Al-Alama Ghulam Dastagir, Qusuri Rahimullah was the first, one of the first to raise his pen and refute Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani. And there were many other ulama who wrote against him at the time. But when he attracted these followers, he wanted to construct this white tower and he was unable to do so and he, because he had lack of funds. And when he was unable to construct the tower, his followers said that, does this not mean the prophecy is not fulfilled? He said that the tower will be constructed after my death so the followers who come after me, they can partake in the reward. This was his interpretation. So when he was alive, this is something for you to remember. When he was alive, there was no actual white tower constructed in Qadian. The white tower was constructed after the passing away of Mirza Ghulam. When he passed away, then afterwards in around 1915, they constructed the white tower. Then the White Tower became the logo for the Qadiani movement, which refers to itself as the Ahmadiyya movement. But how did they influence America? They dispatched Imams across the world, what they refer to as Immatul Masajid, to teach people the teachings of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. And they even sent people to America. When they reached America, they influenced some of the African-American people. One of them was Noble Drew Ali. Noble Drew Ali, in the early 1900s, st started something known as the, uh, the Moors Temple. So these people, they also entered Masonic lodges. They became part of Masonic lodges. They amalgamated teachings of uh, Masonic lodges with what they refer to as Moorish teachers, which was Islam. And then the first presentation of Islam they were given was at the hands of a Qadiani that claimed that a new prophet has emerged in Qadian. And then noble Drew Ali, if you check his biography, he died in, in the early 1900s. The dates, exact dates you will find. If you research, you'll find the exact dates. Within that period of time, he influenced a man known as Walis Fad, or also known as Walis Deen, or Walis Fad. This man, what they refer to as mulatto, is mixed race. He was mixed race, and research regarding him at that time was vague. They couldn't determine where was he actually from, this man Walis Deen. He influenced a man by the name of Elijah Poole. Elijah Poole had moved into areas like Chicago and the urban cities from the country areas in his, when he was in his 30s. And Elijah Poole was going through a distressful time in his life 
working, paying rent, and he came across this man known as Wallis Dean. Wallis Dean taught him that Wallis Dean is Na'udh Billah, the reincarnation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that Elijah is the prophet of God. So he changed his name from Elijah Pool to Elijah Muhammad. Of course, his name is not Muhammad, his name is what? Elijah Pool. Elijah Pool believed he represented two prophets, one is Elijah, one is Muhammad. Not, of course, not Sayyiduna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He claimed he was the prophet sent to the tribe of Shabazz, which he referred to the African American as the tribe of Shabazz, lost in the wilderness of North America. Then what did he do? From the early 1920s and 1930s, firstly, Wallis Dean, or Fard, Fard, F-A-R-D. They worked together, and then Fard suddenly disappeared. Many conspiracy theories arose with regard to the identity of Wallis Fard. To this day, people have conjecture. According to what I've read, he was actually an immigrant from New Zealand. He was from New Zealand. His father was from what is today Pakistan. His father was from the Khyber Pakhtun areas of Pakistan, from a minority sect, not Sunni, from these strange sects you have, like in our Kashmir, in the northern areas, you have what? You have uh, Ismailis. There's a whole area full of Ismailis. They follow Aga Khan, the entire region. So within uh, Kashmir and within the northern areas, Khyber Pakhtun, you have all these weird religions in, as minorities. Wallis Dean's father was from those backgrounds. He married a white woman from New Zealand, and Wallis Dean was bo born. Wallis Dean was then sent in his early 20s or late teens to study in an American university in the early 1900s. Wallis Dean then associated with whom? With Noble Drew Ali, who established the Moorish Temple. But Noble Drew Ali was influenced by whom? By the Qadiani teachers that were sent from Qadian. Then Elijah, when Wallis Dean went missing, Wallis Fahd, he went missing, Elijah Poole established his own sect or his own cult known as the Nation of Islam. In fact, the Nation of Islam, what they refer to as Nation of Islam, was established within the life, within the time of Wallis Dean, Fahd. When he established the Nation of Islam, they attracted and recruited black African people throughout the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. And one of the notable people that they recruited in the 1950s was known as Malcolm Little. Malcolm Little later became known as Malcolm X. And then in the year 1964, the le in late 1964, he left, firstly he left uh, Elijah in 1963 when he made some statements regarding John F. Kennedy. He was exiled from the group, from the nation. And then later in 1964 he adopted Islam. He only adopted true Islam only for around nine months. When he went Hajj and when he returned back, he went, he went to Africa and Al-Azhar. At that time, Elijah Poole was still around, but Elijah Poole had hundreds and thousands of followers. Later on, the son of Elijah Poole, the son of Elijah Poole, in 1973, uh, around that time, when his father passed away, he denounced his father's teachings and he adopted Islam, and then many hundreds and thousands of people entered the fold of Islam because the son left. The false teachings of whom? Of Elijah Poole. But this was the impact. All this history, when you read on it, there is so much history to this. This was the impact of one fitna, one tribulation of a man known as Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani from India. Additionally, if you check the biography of 
the first so-called Khalifa, first so-called Khalifa of the Qadiani group, Hakim Nuruddin. You check his biography. Hakim Nuruddin, when he returned back from Hajj, firstly when he met Al Allama Abdul Ghani Al Dahlawi, Rahimallah, in Makkah Al Mukarramah. He also went to meet Rahmatullahi Kayranwi, Rahimallah, the author of Izharul Haq, because he saw these people were refuting uh, that uh, Molana Rahmatullah was refuting uh, Christians at the time. Molana Rahmatullahi Kayranwi is the one who established Sawlatiya, Madrasa Sawlatiya in Makkah Al Mukarramah. After the rebellion in 1857, uh, he migrated to Makkah al mukarrama Nuruddin Hakim, when he returned back, he attended also the lessons of Qasim Nanotwi. When he attended the lessons in the seminary of Dioband, when he attended the lessons of Qasim Nanotwi, he heard the theory of Qasim Nanotwi as expounded in Tahdeer nas and then he became inspired to find the likes of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Qadiani. He was influenced by that. This Hakim Nuruddin, then when he went to Qadian, he became so close to Mirza Ghulam Ahmed that he became his first Khalifa. Now to slander Al Imam Ahmed Ridha Khan Rahimallah Ta'ala, Ihsan Ilahi Zahir in his book Al Barelwiya to slander Allah and these are things that you know people claim to be followers of Imam Ahmad Ridha Khan Rahimallah Ta'ala and they do not even counter these type of claims to slander Imam Ahmad Ridha Khan he said the first Quran teacher of Imam Ahmad Ridha Khan Rahimallah Ta'ala Na'udhu Billah was a Qadiani why because his name was Mirza he had the name which is a common name in the whole of India, his name was Mirza, it's a Persian name. But of course it's a lie, it's a slander, even Wahhabis will acknowledge that it's a lie because you check the biography of the individual, just because the name is Mirza, he made a lie. So this discredits Ihsan Ilahi Zahir, who wrote this book called al Barelwiya, the Barelwis, which is still published amongst uh, pseudo-Salafis, what they do is they, they publish this type of literature because they do, uh, and this is quite common in the Indian subcontinent, a, they do a smear campaign. So when you want to finish the credibility of your opponent, you make a smear campaign and you make claims which are false. Mudslinging, not academic points. So it, but it nevertheless discredits, it discredits the entire book. Now where we stand with the Qadiani movement, is that the Qadiani movement, because they are a minority, and like all minorities, or not all minorities, some minorities, they are well organized in comparison to the majority. So what they have is that they have meetings with uh, the presidents in the White House. They are treacherous to the state of Pakistan because Salman Ta'seer and his son uh, when Sultar, uh, Salman Ta'seer was gunned down by Mumtaz Qadri, afterwards his son was seen in the White House with Donald Trump and with an old Qadiani man informing Donald Trump that they are a persecuted minority in Pakistan. In order to rile up the Western world against Pakistan and Pakistan's treatment of the Qadianis. So they have always been uh, campaigning what they refer to as human rights in Pakistan, but that's a different issue. They are active in many ways. One of the places that they are active in is Africa. And there were two famous ulama in that period of time who countered them. One was Habib Mashur al-Haddad, rahimallahu ta'ala, from, uh, from Arabia, from the Hijaz. And the other was Al-Allama Abdul Alim al-Sadiqi, rahimallahu ta'ala. These were 
two ulama separately that they counter, uh, countered the Qadiani uh, propagation within Africa. Abdul Alim Sadiqi, rahimallah, was so proactive, you would be surprised. I've traveled to South Africa, I've traveled to Malawi, I've traveled to West Indies. He established masajid in all these countries, but throughout Africa, Mauritius, uh, Uganda, all these areas, wherever you go, Abdul Alim Sadiqi, rahimallah, he established masajid in all those areas. But it, what also surprises you is that a Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Jilani, rahimallah ta'ala, who lived 900 years ago, when you go to Malawi, the African people adopted Islam at the hands of the students of a Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Jilani 900 years ago. In their thousands. So to this day, majority of them are what? Shafi'i Qadri. Shafi'i Qadri. But it shows you that the level of propagation of Islam at the hands of the real awliya, real awliya Allah, meaning a Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Jilani, la niza'a fihi, there's no contention regarding him. Even the Wahhabis accept him. Meaning his wilaya uh, is. Meaning beyond questioning. And yet the, the amount of Islam that spread at his hands, you go into to Lake Malawi, you find hundreds and thousands of Africans who accepted Islam over 900 years ago. This is the effect of the real awliya. So like this, you check the work of Abdul Alim Sadiqi, rahimallah, and I believe, I believe after the Khulafa of Al-Imam Ahmad Rida Khan rahimallahu ta'ala, those who refer to themselves as Barelvis neglected the work of Al-Imam Ahmad Rida Khan rahimallah. If Al-Imam Ahmad Rida Khan rahimallah was alive today, he would deem these people as a new sect. Those who are referring to themselves as Barelvis today, if Al-Imam Ahmad Rida Khan rahimallah was alive today, he would class them as a separate sect that they do not even follow the correct teachings. Why? Because when they adopt the teachings, I can, examples of this are the people in Ajmer. Yes, these uh, Darbaris in Ajmer. The, the amount of bid'ah they have. This was not in a, and they ref, now they refer to Al-Imam Ahmad Rida Khan rahimullah, as Khawarij na'udhu billah. So these are the Ahlul bid'ah that have infiltrated, that have infiltrated, and there is no real groundwork. So the type of work Abdul Alim Siddiqui did, you go to West Indies just to Trinidad alone, just to Trinidad alone, over 90 masjids, was fan, the foundations have been laid down. Over 90 masjids in a small island of Trinidad. You go to Malawi, there are masjids that he laid down the foundations. You go to South Africa, you go everywhere in those regions. He was speaking English and having dialogue with whom? George Bernard Shaw. In the 1930s, George Bernard Shaw, the, by the way, Abdul Alim Siddiqui is the Khalifa of Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, rahimullah, speaking English in the 1930s and speaking with intellectual giants like George Bernard Shaw. Today we have peers who live in this country for 50 years, uh, peers who come uh, from Pakistan with their visas, they come here, they live here, they make money after people, but they cannot even speak a single word of English. How do they represent the work of Imam Ahmad Rida Khan? Rahimallah. Meaning, look at the Khulafa, Zafruddin al-Bihari, uh, the, uh, the intellectual output. He wrote a book, Sahih al-Bihari, which is six volumes on the proofs of the Hanafi school. And so much so that it inspired the Diobandis to write I'la Sunan. Their book I'la Sunan by Zafar Ahmad Tanwi is inspired by Zafruddin al-Bihari's work. Mawlana Amjad Ali Azmi wrote uh, Bihari Shariat. To this day, the, that work needs to be placed into Arabic. Why? Because it's a very easy book to translate into Arabic because most of the uh, passages are already found in Arabic. But Abdul Alim Siddiqui, rahimallah ta'ala, he stands out. 
Why does he stand out? Because of his international nature. He stands out because of his, uh, in, uh, his international nature. That the amount of work he done against the Qadiani movement in Africa today, after that generation of Khulafa, after the likes of uh, Al Imam Mustafa Ridha Khan and all those great Muhaddith um, Azam Pakistan, Alama Ahmed, Sardar Ahmed, Rahimullah. And uh, his student, Mufti Abdul Qayyum Hazari, rahimallah, all these great ulama, after their passing, the rep true representation no longer exists. But we as Sunni Muslims, we must know regarding Khatmu Nabuwa and its intricate link with Al Masjid Al Aqsa. That Al Masjid Al Aqsa and the occupation of Al Masjid Al Aqsa is linked to. Khatmun Nabuwa. Someone may say, how? I'll give you an example. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away, his armor, body armor, was given to a Jew in exchange for what? Bali. That body armor, what we refer to in fiqh as Rahan. Rahan. It was in the possession of a Jew. And the Prophet ﷺ passed away. What, there's something known in Tafsir al-Quran known as Tafsir Ishari. What's Tafsir Ishari? Indication. Like, for instance, when the verse, uh, when the Surah Iza Jaa Nasrullahi Wal Fatih was revealed, Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq and start crying. The younger companions, they said, what is wrong with this old man? The chapter is about the victory of Islam, yet Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu is crying. What did Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq understand radiallahu an? That this means the passing away of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa This is known as Tafsir Ishari. Likewise, at one time the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was sitting on a well and Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq sat next to him. Then Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu anhuma sat next to him. And then Sayyiduna Uthman came and sat on the opposite side. One of the hadith scholars in the books of hadith, he writes, this is the interpretation of their burial. They will be buried like this. The Shaykhain are buried next to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Sayyiduna Uthman radiallahu anh, is buried across in uh, Al-Baqi. This is known as Tafsir what? Ishari. I'll give you a Tafsir Ishari. When the arm of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was rahan with a Jew, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the one who said, Innama ana qasimun wallahu yu'ti. I am a distributor and Allah gives. He was not in need of any Jew. But he purposefully gave his body armor to that Jew to give us a tafsir ishari. What is that tafsir ishari? That tafsir ishari is that in the akhir zaman, the global banking system will hold people to ransom. Yes? So, like this, there is a tafsir ishari with regard to the occupation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Sharif. That when, when you want to know the state of the Muslims, then look at the state of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. If you want to know about the Iman of a Muslim today, Ask him regarding his concern for Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. For instance, there are some people I've interacted, they said, what's so important? These are people who are Muslims. They've said to me, what's so important about Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa? All, all it is is stones. There are people who have said this. All it is is stones. If you want to see the state of the Muslims, you look at Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Sharif. If you want to see the state of a Muslim, Look at his concern for Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, Al-Sharif. So Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is related to Khatm al -Nubuwa. The Quran states, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِّنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ That Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, was not a, is not a man from any, is not a father of any one of the men from amongst you. However, he is what? The finality of prophets. Yes. 
the Messenger of Allah and the finality of prophets. And then you have Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us, Subhanalladhi Asra, glorified be the one who made, his, who made the night journey, Asra, bi abdi with his special servant, meaning Sayyiduna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bi abdi Laylan in a portion of the night, small portion of the night, fraction of the night. Min al Masjid al Harami, from the sanctified Masjid, il al Masjid al Aqsa al Ladi Barakna Hawlahu, to the furthest Masjid, meaning al Masjid al Aqsa al Sharif, al Ladi Barakna Hawlahu, that which we place Baraka around it, li Nuriyahu min Ayatina, in order that we may show him our signs. Inna hu huwa Samiul al Basir, indeed, he, meaning Allah, is what all hearing and all seeing. In that journey, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met all the prophets and led them in prayer in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Sharif signifying Khatm al also. So both of these are interlinked and there is a third interlinking also. That is the appearance of a Dajjal which is a pending meaning some, an event that will occur in the near future. This appearance of a Dajjal relates also to Akhirul Zaman, but it also relates to Khatm al Because the Prophet ﷺ said, 30 false prophets will come, and when the 30 false prophets, uh, the, the last one will be a Dajjal al-Akbar, the major liar. So he will also claim Nabuwa. So when... Ad-Dajjal and his lies relate to Khatm al his occupation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, or his attempt to occupy Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is also intrinsically linked to Khatm al because it's a representation of fitna and tribulation. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to safeguard us from all tribulation and enable us to learn our creed in accordance with Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم وأتوب إليه صلوا على الحبيب صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم Just want to make a, a quick announcement before we start the uh, question and answer session um, It was supposed to be hosted by Barista Harun Rashid but he had some obligations and couldn't make it He did express his uh, desire to want to be here but inshallah I'll be uh, covering. Um, just be before we begin, Molana made an excellent point about um, the Khalifa Wala Hazrat Alayhi Rahma. Molana Abdul Alim Siddiqui Mirti Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alay, and about how he was an international scholar who spoke and also wrote in English. Many people may not know this, but in the Fatawa Razawiya Sharif, there's actually a Fatwa of Allah Hazrat Alayhi Rahmah in the English language. It's been a while since I read it, um, but the English is of a good standard. He was asked the question from an outside country, outside of the subcontinent. And so it was necessary to give the reply in English. Now, Allah Hazrat Alayhi Rahmah, he wrote it in Urdu, but he had a clerk that translated it. And it just shows that... Uh, Things like language should not really be a barrier. And uh, the scholarship, or those scholars who want to do the work, inshallah, things like language are not uh, barriers for them. But in, I'm going to, inshallah, sit down and uh, ask the questions on the mic. I do apologize for my appearance. I had to come straight from work for this. Don't forget, shirt and trousers are not haram. So, Molana, you mentioned uh, the nation of Islam and an influential member of the nation of Islam was Malcolm X. So, what lessons can Muslims learn from the life of Malcolm X? A uh, first lesson from the life of Malcolm X would be integrity. He had powerful integrity because even when the FBI, they placed taps on his private life, they placed taps on uh, the life of Martin Luther as well. And Martin Luther was not uh, practicing his Christianity as he should have been. But when they checked the, life, uh, the private life of Malcolm X, he had integrity. So the first lesson from the life of Malcolm X is integrity. 
Secondly, he had an international political outlook which so many of the Muslims today are lacking. There are very few figures in the Muslim world who have deep penetration uh, foresight into the political, economic uh, situation of the Muslims, meaning the reinstatement of the Khilafah, for instance, and the governance according to Sharia, understanding the economic system of Islam, because Islam, for instance, prohibits riba, usually. And Islam takes zakat for distribution amongst the poor. This law itself has a powerful societal effect. So Malcolm X understood this when he went to Hajj, when he came back. His last month, in the last month of his life, last two months, which city did he visit in the, outside of the United States? The city of Birmingham. He came to my city. And when he came to Birmingham, most precisely Smedic, when he came, he came to Smedic also, uh, he, he looked at the situation of the colored people and the Muslims in 1965. That's how ahead he was of his time. And then he went also to Oxford and uh, took part in the uh, debate in the Oxford University, which you can watch online. But uh, as I said, he had integrity and he understood that there was an Anglo-white power structure with what we refer to as modern capitalism, which was enveloping the globe. And there needs to be a counter to that. So some people, like Tariq Ali, who was a part in the debate, they look to socialism for a solution. Some of them look to communism. Some of them look to nationalism, which is a disease as well. Some of them look to every different philosophy for the solution. Meaning, you have people working in factories like the Gap factories in Indonesia, where they, they glue shoes together and the glue will blind them eventually. This is the kind of exploitation that goes on in the world. How do we finish global poverty and how do we counter zulm, oppression? The solution is Islam. So, uh, returning back to Islam. So, with Malcolm X, there were two lessons mainly. One is integrity. There are more lessons as well. But one was integrity. The second was what? His international perspective. Like Abdul Alim Siddiqui, rahimallah. He had an international perspective. So, you've mentioned um, communism, socialism. Can you please kindly define the concept of communism, socialism, capitalism, and democracy? Very quickly. F uh, firstly, with communism, uh, in Arabic we refer to it as ishtirakiyah, which is a sharing of capital. Sharing of capital in the sense a doctor will earn the same as a farmer. Everyone will earn the same even though their tasks are different. Uh, it's a centralization, complete centralization of government. That government controls everything for fair distribution amongst everyone. It's a result of the thoughts of Karl Marx. It's faulty in so many ways. It didn't work. It, after the Bolshevik uh, Revolution in 1912, it was implemented in Russia. In 1917, you had the history of Russia. You read through that. In 1988, the end of the Cold War, it never worked. It's a despotic system. Socialism is a watered down form of communism. So it shares some principles. As for capitalism, capital, capitalism is dog eat dog, meaning that whoever makes um, uh, money, there's no fair distribution of wealth. So for instance, uh, on the way uh, to, in the service stations, you'll notice that all the shops are owned by corporations. So you have McDonald's, you have Starbucks, there's no, uh, if, if a, an, a, a citizen wanted to open a shop, he would have to overcome so many costs. So the banks will control that, who they loan money to. So capitalism itself is very problematic. Then democracy is in reality tyranny because democracy, firstly, cannot be um, defined correctly. Democracy has its roots in Greek, in Greece, in Athens, but even the Athenians were not real and really democratic. Because when they, when they said democracy, they meant 
uh, the vote for the male, not for the females and not for the slave and the child. So it's very selective. Like today, today's democracy, if someone goes to Ukraine to fight, he's a freedom fighter. If he goes to Palestine to fight, he's a terrorist. So there's double standards of what we refer to as democracy. None of these systems work for Muslims. In the Muslim lands, we need Sharia. We need uh, the, uh, the Nizam of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa as implemented by Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an, as implemented by Salahuddin al-Ayyubi rahimahullahu ta'ala. The nation states that we have today, in summary, is the concept of the modern nation state compatible with Islam and should Muslims pledge their loyalties to nation states? The answer is, it is not compatible with Islam. Uh, people can attempt to make, uh, they attempt to make nationalism compatible with Islam, but the reality is that they will always clash. The nation must have its loyalty to Islam. There's a difference. The people have their loyalty to Islam and the nation has its loyalty to Islam. But nation states are something that were given to us post demolishing of the caliphate. So first you had the demolishing of the Mughal dynasty, the Mughal empire, and you had on the, on the ashes of that, we had three things. You had Muslims in India, you had Pakistan, and then you had East Pakistan, which later became Bangladesh. In the, with the model of what nation states dividing the Muslims. In the Ottoman region, the, the caliphate area, post the Ottomans, you had in place of the caliphate system, you had nation states. So what they want Palestinians to have now is also nation states. So as uh, Jared Kushner mentioned, he said that the Palestinians should accept the two-state solution and just pay their mortgages like everyone else. What does he mean by this? Become maqrood. Makrud in debt to the banking system. Just become like everyone else, sell your land and everyone live on your mortgages and then go mad like the people in the London underground. Sallu ala al Habib, sallallahu ala Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa Can you also comment on the flags that represent the nation states? Again, there's no enmity towards any flags, but the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa had multiple flags. So sometimes in battle, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had a white flag. Sometimes he had a black flag. It's mentioned in the sunnah. None of the flags are something that in reality are sacred to us. Now, the flag of Saudi Arabia has Al-Kalimatul Sharifa written on it. This is why we would never denigrate the flag. At the same time, you should never denigrate the flag of any country because... It, what it causes them to insult Islam. If you denigrate the flag, they will insult Islam, so you avoid denigrating uh, their flags. What is the United Nations, and is it correct for these Muslim majority countries to be members of the United Nations? The answer to that is that the United Nations it was born from the League of Nations. The League of Nations later mutated into what is known as the United Nations. Five countries veto over a hundred countries. So five countries, Russia, China, America, uh, Britain, and France, they can ve and they don't represent a majority, they can veto other countries. And now the five nations amongst themselves are warring. So you have Russia against uh, yeah. France and uh, Britain and America. And then you have China on the side of Russia. So the United Nations can never replace the Khilafah for Muslims. The Muslims need to re-establish Khilafah. So just um, touching on the, off the back of that, we do see that the Muslim nations have pledged their allegiances or have signed up to the charter of the United Nations. Is it realistic for them then to expect the United Nations to be the arbitrators of peace and justice in the land? For instance, in the case of Palestine, and actually this then is, um, raises a bigger question that when we have our own system and our own law from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
how is it then for Muslims to turn their faces away from that system and then to go towards this man-made system? The answer to your question is that uh, when the Balfour Declaration was written in 1917 by Lord Balfour to the most prestigious Jewish citizen of, the Brit of Britain at the time, which was Lord Rothschild, Arthur Rothschild, at that time, this, that same empire was the same empire that established the United Nations. So the same empire that gave guarantees to the Zionists of a Jewish homeland on, Pal on Palestinian soil, on Muslim soil, is the same body of people that veto any movement regarding Palestine. So Muslims should never trust the UN to carry out any resolutions. The UN is a defunct body. It, is, it cannot do anything. The UN couldn't even prevent war in Europe. You have war in Europe now, in Ukraine. The UN cannot even prevent war in Europe. So the Muslims need self-sufficiency. They need to rise and establish their own body, which is known as the Khilafah. Sallu ala al-Habib sallallahu ta'ala ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. The next uh, few questions are, well, I'll summarize them all into one. What are the fundamental principles of debating? What are the pros and cons? And how do you usually prepare for debates? So uh, the fundamental rules of debating, you have uh, the famous one, al-mu'allil and al-mani' or mustadil. Uh, mu'allil is the one who is what? Claiming. He makes the claim and the mani' is the one who will counter the claim. The claim is made in a syllogistic form in a syllogistic form. You make a syllogism and you present your argument. The counter argument must be against one premise or two premises or the entire, pre pre uh, entire argument, the entire syllogism. And that has its terms like mana, mana bi sanad, al munaqada, all these al muarada, these are technical terms when you target one premise or two premises or the entire argument. That's the summary of the rules of debating. And the person who makes the claim, he must counter those counter arguments. The second question was about the pros and cons. The pros and cons is today the majority of uh, Muslims I have encountered cannot debate. So that's the cons, that they, they come from mujadala, which is uh, dispute. They don't know the rules. They don't know how to make a syllogistic argument. They do not know how to counter a syllogistic argument. They have no manners. Qillatul Adab. These are the cons. Uh, there are very few pros. If the person does not to debate, then you will have pros. Uh, with regard to preparation, I never prepare because if you need to prepare, you're not prepared. Subhanallah. Sallu ala al-Habib sallallahu ta'ala ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Many drugs such as heroin, cocaine, cannabis are not apparently mentioned in the Holy Quran. So how do we arrive at the conclusion that these substances are prohibited? So the conclusions are arrived in two ways. One is uh, from Qiyas within the Quran. So the verses that prohibit Khamar, uh, there is Qiyas, which is uh, analogy. And then also from the Hadith Mutawatir, mass transmitted Hadith. Hadith Mutawatir means so many people narrated it, to reject it is bid'ah, which is what? Uh, and sometimes it can be kufr if it's Mutawatir, lafzi. Kullu muskirin haramun, every intoxication is haram. So whatever iskar applies on is haram. So cannabis is haram by ijma the four schools, by the way. In the Hanafi school, you'll find the fatwa in the Hashi of Ibn Abdin Rahmanullah in Raddul Muhtar. In the Shafi'i school, you will find the fatwa. For instance, Imam Abu Hamd al-Ghazali was one of the first ulama to prohibit cannabis. But it's found also in the Zawajir of Ibn Hajar al-Haytami. In the Maliki school, you, you can read the discussion of Abu al-Abbas Ahmad bin Idris al-Qarafi, rahimahullah, in his book al-Furuq. In the Hanbali school, you'll find those scholars post Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah, by the way, even though he's a mutanazi' uh, fihi person, disputed person, the, the, they still count him in the Hanabila discussions of the madhab, even though some of his calls are called marjuh, like talaq thalath, but they have the discussion with regard to what? The cannabis. They, ha they have that discussion with regard. So all four schools prohibit cannabis. 
The next question is about uh, psychedelic drugs, um, such as DMT, and the idea or the concept is propagated uh, in the popular media format a lot by uh, people like Joe Rogan and even Mike Tyson. So, what is what are psychedelics, and what's the Islamic ruling concerning psychedelics? So, psychedelics again, they do fall under iskar. Why they fall under iskar, iskar is intoxication, is because they do take you out of your senses. So uh, it would, uh, the person falls into uh, in a delirious state or uh, the mind begins to imagine things. Now, so I read a book on DMT many years ago, over a decade ago. The researcher, he mentions that they all see an alien-like creature or a being and they discuss with the alien-like creature. Or elves and things like that. Yes, so... They all seem to have a similar type of experience. Is this probing the realm of the jinns? The answer is it's probable, and even if it is, it's still haram. Sallu ala al-Habib, sallallahu ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is epistemology? And can you shed some light on the importance of epistemology? Epistemology is from the Greek episteem which is the method of seeking knowledge. How do you attain knowledge? For us, I'll summarize it. We will have essentially three ways, and we can expand on that also. In fact, there are more than three, but uh, one is the rational judgment. That is the judgment that is solely from the mind, like two plus two is four. Then you have the sensory perception, uh, the senses, the sight, the hearing, the touching, this is also imparts absolute certainty. The third form of knowledge is a combination of both. We have a combination of the sensory perception and of the rational judgment. A fourth type is mass transmission, that we may receive mass transmission with regard to something. So epistemology is how do we attain certainty in knowledge? And it's, aside from being a philosophical debate, it's a discussion in Ilmul Kalam, in theology, and it's something I can tackle in chapter two of my book, Islam Answers Atheism. Can you also shed light on the, the importance of uh, logic? So again, uh, logic is very important uh, because uh, Al Imam Abu Hamd Al Ghazali said, um, whoever does not study Al Mantiq, there is no trustworthiness of his knowledge. So it's something that's utilized, and mantik should not be misconstrued as Greek logic, because the Arabs introduced many questions into logic. So for instance, a dalalat, bahthu dalalat, is introduced by Arabs. It wasn't introduced by Greeks. So logic is not the sole property of the Greeks. In fact, the Arabs developed it. It's essential for Islamic sciences, and reasoning is something that every Muslim should have, and they should not be unreasonable in how they reach a conclusion. So we've just discussed epistemology and logic, which are two fundamental components of critical thinking and reasoning. So off the back of that, how is it then for people to follow popular ideas or ideas that are popularized like the flat earth theory? And can you shed some light on that? And especially, possibly more problematic is those people who try to establish such theories through revelation and, and scripture. So again, flat earth, uh, flat earth theory, in fact, I've debated a person who claims that the earth, earth is flat, the debate is online. Ibn Hazm has a book called Maratib al Ijma. Even though Ibn Hazm is not totally reliable, but in the book Maratib al Ijma, he he, Ibn Hazm and Ibn Taymiyyah has a commentary on this. They claim that there is ijma on the fact that the ulama believe that the earth is round. But there were some commentators of the Quran that mention when the earth is described as being bisaf, as being a spread, they said the earth is flat. And according to the astrophysicists or scientists of the day, the earth is round. So, and then what happens is both groups, they attempt to interpret verses of the Quran to prove that the earth is actually flat or round. So, وَالْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ دَحَاهَا uh, The word dahaha has a meaning of being round. And there are other verses of the Quran. 
But the best way of refuting flat earth theory is through empirical proof. What is the empirical proof? The empirical proof is when you have a lunar eclipse, the earth comes between the sun and the moon, and the reflection of the earth we observe on the moon, what reflection does it show? The shape of what? A disc, round. So this demonstrates that the earth is actually round. Sallu ala al-Habib sallallahu ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What care should Muslims and, and scholars take when answering, commenting or speculating on issues that are related to specialized sciences? Yes, so they should attempt to be precise. Sometimes when you're not precise uh, with your research or with your wordings, then uh, you can fall into mistakes. So it's best to uh, research a topic before giving a response. Also, if um, on this, if you can touch upon the, uh, uh, the, the, the concept of the appeal to authority and how you should actually be careful and critical when appealing to authority, because even though authorities are accepted, they can be manipulated, etc. Et if you can. So appeal to authority is a fallacy, which is if someone makes a claim, they appeal to an authority in order to validate the fallacy. So this can be misconstrued sometimes uh, the, uh, the authority that overrides everything in reality is after the Quran and Sunnah is the Ijma so uh, you have firstly you have Quran then you have Sunnah then you have Ijma but even with Quran and Sunnah the deviated groups sometimes will attempt to distort the verses so if I recited to you the verse uh, regarding Khatm al Nabuwa the Qadianis will have their own distortion of that verse so how do we safeguard ourselves from that? The answer is Lugha. It's essential people have a mastery of the language. So Arabic language, they cannot distort the rules of language and how the rules of language dictate to us the understanding of the language. This next question is um, about the idea of the surveillance state. So in, in this day and age, this is becoming an ever prevalent reality. Is the idea of a governmental body spying on its citizens compatible with Islamic governance? And does Islam provide a moral mechanism concerning the issue of privacy? The answer is uh, the modern surveillance state is not, in, is not compatible with Islam. Uh, Islam does not centralize everything. So the citizens have autonomy to a great degree. So aside from the establishment of hudud and uh, the, the punishments uh, and uh, to keep law and order, the government does not interfere in the autonomy of individuals to the degree of a surveillance state. So a surveillance state would, it would be deemed as un-Islamic. Sallu ala al-Habib, sallallahu ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa In recent times, the media has been more accepting of the UFO phenomena also known as the UAP uh, phenomena, so that's unidentified, unidentified flying objects. According to polls, more and more people believe in the idea of aliens. In your opinion, is there an agenda at play here? So again, uh, as far as the UFO phenomenon goes, I believe that the Area 51 was in fact a military zone in which during the Cold War, the Americans were testing weapons and using weaponry and it's just a militarized zone that people have made spun a conspiracy theory regarding. Uh, there, is not, there are no green aliens behind uh, those sightings. So scientists have recently been finding more and more exoplanets which have the potential of hosting life. This in turn has strengthened the view that there is alien life out there. So number one, is there alien life outside of our world? And how does this question impact Islamic theology? So, in response to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنَ الْأَرْضِ مِثْلَهُنَّ uh, وَمِنَ الْأَرْضِ مِثْلَهُنَّ that There are seven heavens, and from the earth there are seven planets similar to planet earth. وَمِنَ الْأَرْضِ مِثْلَهُنَّ Under the commentary of this, they state that there are seven earth-like planets, including earth, there are seven earth-like planets. So there are other creatures, and there are other planets and universes that do exist. This, even if an alien spaceship appeared tomorrow, it doesn't affect our Iman because Allah created 
numerous types of beings, even though I believe they will not be. But if there was, it doesn't affect our iman because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates all sorts of beings. Subhanallah. Sallu ala al-Habib sallallahu ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The Quran uses the term alameen many times. What does this term include and is it compatible with the idea of a multiverse? Uh, the answer is yes, al alameen is compatible with the multiverse and the multiverse does not in fact negate the idea of contingency of, a, of the universe. al alameen is so broad as a term that even a creature like the ant, you can have alamun naml, the world of the ant, alamul insan, the world of human beings, meaning so many mutanawwi' types of al awalim. So a multiverse can fall into that also, a parallel universe is also. So we live in a social media age, and media is obviously very influential in this day and age. <coughs> How should Muslims approach the reports of mainstream media and what can Muslims do to identify propaganda and can you please touch upon the, uh, the idea of the weaponization of media? Uh, in reality, all media is propaganda. So uh, the best way is not to watch the news. If you want to know about an issue, read something because you can re critically analyze what's being stated. That's the best way of attaining uh, news. Uh, sometimes it's not so important to know everything. So why is it important for me to know about an event that happens in Japan which will not influence me in any way or affect my life in any way? So this modern concept that uh, people need so much information, it leads to information overload that we cannot synthesize the information. We can never synthesize the information, meaning we cannot make sense of what's going on in the world because there are so many events happening that it becomes difficult to determine what is actually occurring and how it is occurring. So the less media you watch, the better it is for you, and the more you read, the better it is for you. Okay. It's a question that's already on the list, and it's in regards to different types of currency. So can you comment and share your thoughts on, number one, the fractional reserve banking system? And I just want to uh, add something here for the, you know, for, for the awareness of the audience. Some of these terms may be a little bit difficult, but they are very important because whether we know it or not, these things really affect our lives uh, more than what we, uh, or how we perceive we're distracted in many ways, but uh, there's, there has been an enslavement of humanity ba based upon the financial system. It's one of the greatest corruptions of modern society. So the fractional reserve banking, centralized fiat currencies, this is one thing. And then also you have this idea of decentralized cryptocurrency. And then something that's uh, to be introduced, that's CBDCs, which, is, which are centralized uh, or central bank digital currencies, and one element that's ma that makes that stand out is the fact that this will be algorithmic money and will allow the banking systems much more control over our lives, and then the traditional gold and silver money. Uh, the first three that you mentioned, fractional reserve banking, uh, and then you mentioned digital currency, and then the CB. CBDC, central bank digital yeah, currencies. Uh, central bank digital currency, all three are a fraud. These three are not compatible with Islam because they are not uh, intrinsic value. They have no intrinsic value. In fact, cryptocurrency is uh, in the 1980s. People had pyramid schemes. It's just a digital version of a pyramid scheme. So many of you will say we've got money in cryptocurrency and we earn this much. How many of you actually pull out your money and benefit from the money? All you will do is you'll put the money in, you'll put a thousand pound in, you'll say you've got two thousand pound, three thousand pound, five thousand pound, ten thousand pound. You leave the digital currency in the system, you never take it out and benefit. One day it will crash because it's not centralized. It will crash and most people will lose their money. Uh, with regard to fractional reserve banking, it's giving out more money than you have in the reserves. That's when the reserves were gold. Now that's finished from the 1970s, early 1970s, after the time of Richard Nixon. There's no gold to back that currency. 
So the, the scam is even worse because you have fiat money, which has no intrinsic value. And then this third one, which is digital, uh, basically uh, algorithmic money. Algorithmic money sounds worse. So uh, the, the Khilafah, when it returns, shall go back to what gold and silver and metal currency. So you have gold, silver, and then you have uh, falus, which is the lesser currencies. Gold, uh, silver, and then the metal currencies. This is better. Yeah, in regards to the algorithmic money that's coming out, um, the governments are working on, on that. And one of the proposed ideas or ways in which this money can be implemented is, for example, when as the globalist agenda are pushing forward this uh, climate change uh, agenda, if the governments decide that all citizens should have, for example, carbon credits, and you're only allowed to purchase a certain, or, or uh, you're, you're allowed to use a certain amount of uh, carbon on your credits, then once you reach your limit, the banks can automatically put limits and restrictions. They can put limits on restrictions uh, on your travel. Uh, if you've been traveling a lot, then next time you try and, to go and purchase a ticket, it'll just automatically um, decline your transaction. This next question is about uh, differences of opinion. Are differences of opinion always a negative? And also, if two Sunni Muslims have a difference of view on a subsidiary ma uh, matter, how should they resolve it? So, uh, all ikhtilaf is not bad. Ikhtilaf, uh, ikhtilaf ummati rahma, the dispute of my nation is a mercy. Uh, the ikhtilaf which is bad, is the ikhtilaf which comes down to that which is ma'alum fi din bi darura, known in religion by necessity, or bi darura illa ahl sunnah, which is mujma' alay positions. That is a bad ikhtilaf. If Sunnis ulama do have a dispute, they should res resolve the issues privately rather than divulging the issues in public because most of the public will not understand those disputes. Sallu ala al Habib, sallallahu ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Inshallah, it's time for Isha. Azan shall be said. Mukhtisar dua. Jazallahu anna Sayyidina Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam ma huwa ahluh. Jazallahu anna Sayyidina Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam ma huwa ahluh. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-afwa wa al-afiyata wa al-ni'mata al-da'ima wa dawama al-ni'ma. Wa nas'aluka al-mu'afa fi al-sihati wa al-badni wa al-mali wa al-ahli wa al-awdadi wa al-irdi wa al-aqli wa al-dini wa kulli shayin ya Rabb al-alamin. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين بارك الله